Hi friends, Papa Dale here once again. We are pursuing our Christ versus Culture series, the never-ending <laughs> series that will continue to go on and on until the Lord takes me home or until we all get raptured. So uh, this is uh, um, a playlist whose purpose is to provide a body of content for Christian believers so that they can be edified and educated from it. In addition, it's a body of content that's intended to be left behind for those who are left behind after the rapture of the believing church so that then they can be directed to it by the Holy Spirit and perhaps learn something a little bit more about the Bible and uh, how that impacts their life. So who am I? I'm Papa Dale, and I am a pastor, retired, pastor, teacher, theologian, uh, chaplain, evangelist. <laughs> Done a lot of things in 50 plus years of Christian service. If you want to know more about me, uh, you can find my video, about four and a half minute video, that tells a little bit about my background, education, and church service, and so forth. And the truth is, you should want to know something about anybody who uh, tries to teach you anything about the Bible. Scripture says that in the end days, there are going to be a lot of false teachers arise. So you want to know a little bit about those that are trying to teach you about the Bible. And uh, you want to compare everything that anybody teaches you with what the Word of God says itself. You be skeptical of everybody and everything. You check everything out, including me. So... Today we are going to embark on a study. It's called the Resurrection Minimal Facts Argument. And it is evidence that demands that you choose what you're going to believe. And it begins, the truth of Christianity is established by the preponderance of the historical evidence of the resurrection. If you use the facts agreed upon by skeptical scholars only, there are six undeniable facts that together provide overwhelming historical evidence of the veracity of the resurrection of Christ. And so what I mean by that is historical evidence. Historical evidence is eyewitness evidence, basically, and the uh, historical record of written evidence. That's what historical evidence is. Um, evidence for historical events, like the resurrection, cannot is not the same kind of evidence that a lot of atheists try to lay on Christians. They say, well, give me scientific evidence. Well, how in the world are we going to do that? You and I can't go back in time and scientifically examine the body of Christ as he's being buried, to see if he's really dead or not. <laughs> you know, scientific evidence is impossible for historical events. So we're going to talk some more about that too. All modern, reputable, scholarly critics agree with the following. One, Jesus lived and died by crucifixion and was raised from the dead. Two, his disciples had experiences that they believed were appearances of the resurrected Christ. Three, their belief turned the world upside down, religiously, with adherents being willing to die rather than deny what they knew to be true about Christ. Four, Christ's resurrection was proclaimed very early on, not first by Paul, who was converted two years later, but by uneducated fishermen disciples. 5. James, the half-brother of Jesus, had experiences that he believed were the appearances of his brother, the risen Christ, and he proclaimed it under threat of death. 6. <laughs> 6. Paul, the chief enemy of this faith, had experiences that he believed were appearances of the risen Christ, and he was converted and proclaimed the truth of the risen Christ under the threat of death. The best explanation for these facts is that 
God, in fact, raised Christ from the dead. It's called Occam's Razor. The simplest argument is the most likely, and it pertains here. Now, we can only know anything from history by historical evidence. That's what I was talking about before. We can only know about, let's say, George Washington, that he was the first president of the U.S. from books and archaeology and the impact that he made on the world. It's the same for any historical figure. It's the same for Galileo. It's the same for Hitler. It's the same for uh, Martin Luther King. It's the same for uh, Napoleon. It's the same for Pharaoh or Caesar. And it's the same for Christ and the resurrection. The historical evidence is based on early evidence and eyewitness evidence. So let's talk about early evidence. Mark was written about 55 AD. That's the resurrection plus about 20 years in round numbers. Matthew and Luke were both written about five years later in about 60 AD or about plus 25 years from the resurrection. John was written about 90 AD or about plus 60 years after the resurrection. All of these writings and dates are considered as having been written very early after the fact in historical studies, especially in ancient liter literature studies. And so very, very early after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, these written narratives began to come out. Actually, they are predated by a whole lot of other written narratives that came out. Uh, but those weren't considered um, uh, inspired by God. A lot of them had, uh, had uh, uh, accounts and events that disqualified them. They weren't written by the apostles, for one thing. And uh, Jesus said that it would be the apostles whose memories would be guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. And so there's a difference between the writings of the apostles and the writings that came before the apostles. Now, some of those writings uh, may have had truth in them, and some of those writings may have been uh, received by the apostles and have been used as uh, historical sources, but only when the Holy Spirit inspired it to be done that way. So... Um, all of these are considered as all of the, the writings, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of these are considered as having been written very early after the fact in terms of historical studies, especially in ancient literature studies. Ancient secular books referring to Jesus were written by Josephus, Tacitus, Suetonius, Pliny, and some dozen others, most written within 60 to 100 years, after the resurrection. By comparison, we have only four to five ancient writings on Alexander the Great, yet we believe all of the, the writings, all of the historical writings that we read about Alexander the Great. Okay, but um, the earliest of the writings about Alexander the Great were written three to 450 years after his death. And here we have writings about Christ written 20 and 30 and 60 years after his resurrection. Christian events are the best historically documented in ancient history. If you disbelieve the events of Christianity, logically, you must also disbelieve the events reportedly done on Alexander or on Napoleon or on Pharaoh. You can't have it both ways. Skeptics rebut this argument by saying that the earliest sources cannot be trusted as reliable because they report the working of miracles. They're fantasy. They're fanciful. They indict the, the Christian sources with an accusation, however, that they overlook or discount in the literature of every other ancient biography that they accept. They all include the supernatural as well. 
all of the ancient literature did. A prime example is the tale of the founders of Rome, Romulus and Remus, who were reportedly miraculously raised by wolves. Do you believe that? The fact is, every reputable scholar, Christian and skeptic as well, all believe something beyond the working of naturalism happened in and through the life of Jesus. Now, they disagree on the means, and they disagree on the meaning, but they agree that something special happened. They agree that something beyond the natural happened. Secondly, eyewitness testimony. Truth can be dug out by sifting through a large volume of testimony, multiple accounts, the veracity of witnesses, the testimony of enemies, the impeachability of the evidence, and so on. The accounts of Jesus Christ's resurrection appearances were all point-of-view testimony. If the descriptions were all exactly the same, identical, the same manufactured conclusion would, like, would be the likeliest explanation. That's the conclusion of J. Warner Wallace, America's best cold case detective. He says that in, in the forensic science of criminology, that when you have witnesses that, that describe the event, the same event, and they describe it with exactly the same language, with exactly the same details, you know that there's collusion there. You know that it's made up eyewitness testimony. But when the details have certain variations and, and different point of view and different things are observed by different people, that's when you can know that the testimony is truthful. Now, the events are not told exactly, the events of the scripture and of the life and death and resurrection of Christ are not told exactly detail by detail, but they are compatible and they harmonize in a highly credible report. The first eyewitness of the resurrected Christ were women. Now, the women went to the tomb to further anoint the body of Jesus, body for long-term burial. And they found the stone already rolled away. His body was missing. And two angels were present to explain what happened. They said, and the scripture says, quote, It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and the mother of Mary of, J Mary, mother of James and the other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. Luke 24, 10, John 20, Matthew 28. And Mark 16. And again, skeptics will say, well, you know, how come one gospel tells that there is one woman and another gospel says that there are two women? Well, you know, if you have a whole group of women that go, you might decide as a historian or as a writer recording these events to focus on just one woman or on two women and what they said and how they interacted. And you might neglect to tell the story of all the women. And so it would harmonize totally. That's not evidence that the stories are wrong. It's actually evidence that the stories are right and that there's not been collusion. A strong evidence that the narrative truly happened is that the credit for the first to see the risen Christ was given to women. In the first place, women were considered unreliable witnesses in the ancient Near East. And if the disciples were going to manufacture a story about Christ rising from the dead, they would not say that it was the women who saw him first, because that would discredit the story. They would say, oh, well, it was Peter and John, or it was disciples, or it was this man or that man. Not women. But the truth of the matter is that it was the women, and so they reported the truth. The women would have been credited only if it actually happened just this way. And they are credited. In addition, four independent sources report the same thing. Additional appearances of Christ were to Peter alone, 1 Corinthians 15.5, to the twelve, with Thomas absent, 1 Corinthians 
and to 500 believers all at the same time. This was the likely appearance in Galilee, where Jesus probably taught them in a crowd, as he so often had in life, 1 Corinthians 15, 6, and also to James, his half-brother, who became the leader of the Jerusalem church in 1 Corinthians 15, 7. That's reported. Then to all the apostles, including Thomas, when he invited Thomas to feel the nail prints in his hands and the gash in his side. And then he revealed himself to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, miles away. The appearance in Galilee was miles and miles and miles away. And now here he is walking on the road to Emmaus with these disciples in Luke 24, 13. And the final appearance of Christ was to Saul of Tarsus, the chief persecutor of the church, who became Paul the apostle to the Gentiles. Here's a guy who had letters from the Jewish political religious leaders in Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin, to go to Damascus and to kill the Christians. Kill the people of this sect. They're blasphemers. So off he goes to do his duty to God, or so he thought. And Jesus appears to him on the road to Damascus and changes his life. These appearances were all sudden and shocking and without warning. They were separated by time, over 40 days, and distance, it's about 200 miles from Galilee to Jerusalem. And they were all the people who had personal close contact with Christ for three and a half years in his life, in his physical life, and would easily recognize him. Two of them, in fact, James and Jude, were his half-brothers, who grew up with him in the same house. Now, we don't know how much older Jesus was than James and Jude, but let's presume that maybe five years or ten years. So they spent years and years living in the same house, probably sleeping in the same bed, probably pranking one another like kids do and wrestling and teasing one another. These people, James and Jude, knew Jesus Christ, their half-brother. They lived with him for years. Now, the effort of the ruling class to suppress and make, and make the disciples recant the testimony of these witnesses included individual isolation, beatings, torture, threats of death, death itself, Yet, in spite of the coercion, there is no record that any of them ever changed their mind. In fact, in church history, there are all kinds of records of them going to their death and proclaiming the risen Christ. They didn't even deny it to save their own life. They each were certain that they had seen the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Highly acclaimed top historical Jesus scholar and a self-proclaimed religious liberal, the former professor at Duke and Oxford, E.P. Sanders, in his book, The Human Figure of Jesus, said the following. Scholars agree that after his death, Jesus appeared to his early disciples. Another New Testament scholar, Gerd Ludemann, who is also an atheist, an inveterate and outspoken atheist, says this, quote, The evidence is that Christ rose from the dead, end quote. Well, so then why doesn't he believe in Christ as a Savior? Why does he remain an atheist? Well, why did the O.J. Simpson jurors find him not guilty, even though the DNA evidence, the fingerprint evidence, and the eyewitness evidence all said that he was there and he was guilty. <laughs> People believe what they want to believe. They don't necessarily believe what the evidence shows them. If they have a corrupt heart and they are insistent, no matter what, they're not going to believe in, in God, they won't. In fact, Jesus tells a story uh, in, uh, in the Gospel of Luke 
about uh, a man named Lazarus who died and went to Hades. And Hades at that time had two compartments, one for people who lived in torment, one for people who lived in paradise awaiting their resurrection. And it was called Abraham's bosom. And uh, there was a man that was living in the torment side and he called out to Lazarus to go to his, his brothers that were still alive on earth and warn them of impending judgment. And Abraham, who was also there in Abraham's bosom along with Lazarus, Abraham says, you know what? He said, if they're not going to believe the prophets and the writings and the Torah, if they're not going to believe that, then they're not going to believe even if somebody comes back from the dead. <laughs> and that's what Jesus did. And they, and they chose to not believe. And so some people are so entrenched in their either hatred for God or their love for themselves and elevating their own ego to the status of the of God over their own life. They're not going to believe no matter what the evidence. And so this has been a lesson on some of the basic, basic, minimal facts about the uh, life, burial, crucifixion, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So those are my thoughts on this topic. If you have comments or thoughts, you can leave them in the comments section below. Don't make them a master's thesis long. I'll just delete those. <laughs> uh, you can also, you can leave longer ones on my Facebook if you wish, Dale Warren at Facebook, um, or uh, a direct message me there. Now, I don't know what the next video is going to be because uh, I, I go by the leading of the Holy Spirit, so... Uh, I'm not sure what we're going to be looking at for the next one, but they're all good. They've all been good so far, and uh, the next one's going to be good too. Uh, and so I will see you next time. And until then, this is your old pal, Papa Dale, signing off. And I'm telling you, I'm going to pray for you that you will be well and that you'll be blessed. <laughs>